Thursday the 8th of May 1945 was a sunny day in the black country. A day to celebrate a hard-won victory in Europe. A day to come out onto the streets and enjoy parties with family, friends and neighbours in the shadows of the mines, forges and factories which had made victory possible. Some paused to wonder what the future would hold. Would austerity continue? Would history repeat itself with economic depression and high unemployment following a world war? Or would these post-war years bring prosperity and social democracy? The answers to these questions would shape the lives of future generations of black country families and profoundly alter the futures of thousands of people in the far distant Caribbean and on the Indian subcontinent. Forging Ahead follows the fascinating story of this industrial region at the heart of post-war Britain, as its people move from austerity to prosperity. Industry shaped the post-war history of the black country as it had shaped its fortunes since the 19th century. Readily accessible coal and other rich mineral deposits made this region the powerhouse of a nation that had become the world's first economic and imperial superpower. But the British economy had been a casualty of the Second World War. The victory being celebrated in the streets of the black country had been bought at a very heavy price. In 1945, the black country was still one of the most important industrial regions in the country and therefore at the forefront of the government's plans for recovering the economy after the, the devastation of the war. The country was very near bankrupt and it needed places like the black country to build things for export to improve its economic situation. Britain urgently required the wealth being generated by international trade, so any recovery had to be export-led. The diversity of black country products would be critical to the country's success. The black country had made its name on kind of old-fashioned metal bashing industries, um, making pig iron and making nails and things like that. But it had to diversify over the years and had so built up a huge amount of expertise and skill within the area. So that by the 1940s and 50s, you could come to the black country for um, mass-produced things, but also bespoke items of machinery, equipment, of all kinds of things that people might need. For example, Aquas and Pollock in Albury were making things like javelins and bows and arrows, but they also made the smallest tubes in the world, about a quarter of the diameter of a human hair. So the black country made all sorts of things and the pots and pans, chains and nails, but also washing machines and bits for cars. And those cars would lead the recovery. Although the region's days of assembling cars were over, many of the body shells, metal castings and pressings as well as vital components for cars assembled in Birmingham, came from black country companies. Among them, Rubri Owen in Darleston was central to the success of the iconic Mini and many other models. The black country made all the stuff to go in the cars, so everything from gearboxes to pistons to all sorts really, and were put together elsewhere, but uh, that was really the big driver of the economy. And right through into the 50s and 60s and later as well, the car industry was really central to what made the black country economically prosperous. As the world's economy recovered, demand soared. The strategy for an export-led recovery was succeeding and Britain's share of world trade rose to a staggering 25%. Meanwhile at home, economic growth was driven by the country's rush to rebuild. Bricks, steel and iron, as well as a multitude of other products all made in the black country, were in high demand. In fact, demand was often so great that it outstripped supply so the industry of the region had to respond with innovation and ingenuity. The black country was very much a region where innovation was central to everything that was done. Almost every factory would have had a drawing office. You could come to a company with an idea and they would be able to turn it first into a drawing and then take it to the pattern shop to get it made into a prototype and then taken to the foundry where you could have it cast. And uh, almost every company could do this for you and it showed the expertise and skills that was available in the area. Research and design was uh, central to everything these companies did. As post-war prosperity increased, life improved. In the home, new labour-saving appliances started to arrive in growing numbers 
from manufacturers such as Cannon in Coesley, whose cookers became an everyday feature of kitchens all over Britain. Other local companies, world-renowned for their industrial products, like glassmakers Chance Brothers and plastics manufacturers British Industrial Plastics, ventured into this booming consumer market and brought design flair into the home. Significant investment was also put into modernising the region's traditional industries. This period was a picture of both continuity and change in the black country. So a lot of the old industries persisted. Uh, coal was still mined and in fact a lot of the mines were upgraded and modernised. Mines like Samwell Park and Bagridge became really, really productive with new machinery and that kind of thing. And a lot of the older industries like chain, nail making, screw making, lock making, they modernised and uh, retained some of that old expertise. Alongside this more traditional way of working, there was new ways of working with mechanisation in a lot of foundries. Instead of being small masters in the traditional sense with um, small workshops and just a handful of men, companies were becoming great big conglomerates. And change was everywhere in the landscape. At the end of the war, poor, old and often unsanitary housing was typical across the region. It had blighted the lives of working class families for generations, but now there was a concerted effort to sweep away these dilapidated buildings and replace the old slums. The built environment changed hugely over this time period. Um, at the end of the war, the typical black country landscape was old houses um, and old shops and buildings are surrounded by wasteland and derelict land. By the end of the 1960s, this had changed completely and the map of the black country looked very different. So rather than small communities surrounded by green, towns were now touching and they had been expanded with large housing estates. That was one of the government's key priorities to make sure that everybody had somewhere to live. New high-rise flats were everywhere. A lot of the old derelict land had been cleared. Um, councils were usually responsible for this because they were the only ones that could shoulder the cost of clearing the land. But sustaining the economic growth which underpinned these advances was under threat. There was a serious shortage of labour which became critical, particularly in the infamously tough foundries where temperatures regularly exceeded 50 degrees centigrade. Jobs became progressively more difficult to fill and by the mid-1950s, Wolverhampton alone reported more than 1,500 job vacancies. To solve this problem, Britain did what it had done in the World War. It reached out to its now former colonies, particularly those in the Caribbean and on the Indian subcontinent. Invitations were sent with the promise of plentiful jobs and high wages. The response was positive. Groups of often single men arrived in the black country and soon became an integral part of the workforce. By the mid-1960s, for example, more than half of the foundry workers at Bermid in Smethwick came from the subcontinent. They were welcomed by the company. But others were not so fortunate and faced discrimination from employers and trades unions in their workplaces. Many of these new arrivals moved into the poorest and most run-down housing, sharing rooms and sometimes beds, according to shift work. This provoked a backlash in some local communities. Although in towns like Smethwick, where their numbers remained comparatively small, less than 6% of the population, immigrants became a focus for overt racism, which was whipped up for political ends. In 1964, in Smethwick, the attention of the media was really focused on that town because the Conservative candidate there, Peter Griffiths, was using explicitly racial terms to whip up support for his own case on an anti-immigrant basis um, and really he was responsible for a lot of the anti-immigrant feeling in the town himself because he was using it for political gain. A similar figure in some ways is Enoch Powell who was a constituency MP for Wolverhampton uh, became most famous for a speech in uh, Birmingham in 1968 known as the Rivers of Blood speech which was an opportunity for him to blame immigrants for all the social ills that were experienced in Wolverhampton. He used a lot of local examples from the town um, of how immigrants had come and ruined neighbourhoods. In fact, these were all made up and there was no evidence to support them. And again, Powell can be blamed for a lot of the racial tension and the racial violence that was directed towards immigrants uh, in the aftermath of that. While these events grabbed headlines and tarnished some perceptions of the region, it ignored the general acceptance of these new arrivals. As single men were joined by their families, 
They helped to establish today's proudly multicultural black country. Although it's very easy to focus on some of the examples of racism that, uh, and discrimination that occurred, in fact, most people got on very well on a day-to-day -day basis with their new colleagues, forming lifelong friendships and working alongside each other just as normal. At this time, another fundamental change was happening to the black country. The region's government was being radically reorganised. Prior to the 1960s, it had retained its historic character of fiercely individualistic towns, many of which owed their existence to skills honed over decades in specialised trades, such as lock making, leather working or chain making. As a result, a conglomeration of 21 independent local authorities had grown up. As the region grew, this mishmash of authorities hampered planning and investment and moves from Whitehall to consolidate local government were strongly opposed by many of these individualistic communities. But in 1966, five in large county boroughs, Wolverhampton, Warsaw, Dudley, West Bromwich and Worley, eventually took over. Yet the regional consciousness and pride that was generated during this period can still be found today in the vibrant Black Country Living Museum. So looking back to those men and women celebrating victory in 1945, how had their hopes and fears been realised and how had their experiences affected the Black Country we know today? What's really interesting about this period is it really marks that transition from the Victorian black country that we learn about here at the museum and at school, where workers were exploited and poorly paid and uh, suffered for their work, to the modern black country that we live in and we understand now with its new houses and new types of work. This was really the, the period that marked the transition between the two. It also provides a really stark contrast with what happened in the late 1970s and 1980s when uh, many of the industries and businesses in the area closed down, unemployment was high. It was just a few years before where they could look back and people could say, well, we had it good. We had good wages, we had good secure employment and now we don't. And to look back and think, well, what has changed? What, um, what is it we understand about ourselves? Forging Ahead, a new book exploring the fascinating post-war era in the black country, is available now. <laughs>